Welcome to the Virtual Center for Archives and Records Administration's panel, Survey Says, Developing Criteria for VR Courses. Vacara is a student-centered alumni group established in 2009 at San Jose State University at the School of Information. Vacara specializes in using virtual worlds for higher ed, distance learning, especially for information and you can learn more about Vacara. You'll see the link in the text chat at their blog. In preparation for an upcoming course in headset compatible virtual reality, Vacara created a survey to establish criteria for teaching in this new medium. Our question that we asked, how does it differ from 3D virtual worlds? And how is it the same? They conducted the survey from August through September 2019 using SurveyMonkey and disseminated it via headset and desktop, the desktop VR education-oriented groups, such as Discord, Second Life, Kitely, and social media, such as Facebook. I'm Dr. Valerie Hill, and I'm going to be the panel's moderator. I'm the director of the Community Virtual Library in Second Life and other virtual worlds, and you can learn more about CVL. There's our website in the text chat. You can also message me after this presentation. I'm also a library and information science educator researching the use of virtual environments for learning, and there's my email in the text chat. Today's panelists are Dr. Marie Vans, Elise Donovan Jones, Dr. Pat Franks, Bree Theodore, and Bethany Winslow. Marie is a senior scientist, research scientist at HP Labs and a volunteer for Vicara since 2015. I'll put all the emails in the text chat. Elise is independent digital curation asset management consultant, and she has a passion as a virtual world librarian. She's the community virtual library's assistant director, and Elise conducts groundbreaking research in virtual education and librarianship. Pat is the coordinate, coordinator for the Master of Archives and Records Administration program at San Jose State University, and she's the administrator for Vacara. Bree is a volunteer builder for the Community Virtual Library, the nonprofit Commons Resource uh, Commons Library, and for Vacara in Second Life. She works as a cataloging and processing assistant for the Hoover Institution Library and Archives. Bethany is an instructional designer with eCampus at San Jose State University and a volunteer with the Community Virtual Library. She's the project lead and curator for the Hypergrid Resource Center in OpenSIM. And I might mention that Marie is also the curator of the Digital Citizenship Museum in Kiteley. So before we begin with our first question, Elise is going to give out a thank you gift for your attendance today and that so that you can get into the spirit of VR exploration. So Elise, feel free to hand out the Oculus Rift SDK model by William Burke. <laughs> And then we will just dive right in to our first question. We're going to begin with Marie, with question number one. Marie, virtual reality is a relatively new advancement in immersive education, while 3D virtual worlds have been around for decades. Because of this, there's an experience gap between VR headset, I might say, educators who have migrated from 3D worlds and educators who have only recently discovered immersive education through a VR headset. Did you account for this gap in the survey? And how did the gap affect the survey's results? Well, while coronavirus has really brought home the critical need for online meeting capabilities, researchers and companies have been looking at virtual worlds to make online activities more immersive for a while. Most have focused on the use of desktop 3D virtual worlds, like here in Second Life. Um, and I have put a, a, there should be, yeah, a, um, a reference for that in the, uh, in the chat. Biggest issue with these platforms has been the steep learning curve. 
With the increase in compute power and decrease in the cost of VR headsets, social virtual reality has suddenly become viable, and with it, applications such as conferencing, distance education, and meetings. VR Scout points out that academic research is now being conducted all over the world to investigate not if XR or mixed reality works, but how it works and what considerations must be taken into account when designing content. In an article that claims 2020 will be a breakthrough year for AR and VR. And as Val said, in the fall last year, Vakara started looking into the possibility of creating a space similar to Vakara Island in Second Life, but in virtual reality. We began by looking at several different social VR spaces, such as Sansar, Altspace VR, and others, but quickly realized that each had their own pros and cons, and none had all the functionality we thought was needed. This led us to create a survey for a target audience of virtual world educators with the goal of determining a set of criteria that any social VR platform would have to address in order to meet the needs of this population. So the set of, the, the set of criteria is shown here on the box that I've just put down. And as you can see, there are 29 or so criteria, and each one reflects some functionality that we are used to using here in Second Life and other OpenSIM platforms. In a minute, I'll show you the top eight needed criteria that emerged from this survey. As part of our research, we are interested in finding out what folks who have experienced teaching in virtual worlds feel they would need to deliver comparable edu experiences in virtual reality. Obviously, expertise plays a very important role here. And when I looked at the results of this survey, I found some very interesting things. So let me show you a couple of graphs here. Now, the first graph I'm, sh I'm showing you here shows the results of the survey demonstrating preferred VR platforms based on experience teaching in virtual worlds. The data for experience is broken out into four experience groups, less than a year, between one and five years, five and 10 years, and 10 or more years. The first, the first one shows the answers for the least amount of experience, and the next one I'll show that for the most amount of experience. As you can see, Engage VR is the platform of choice for the majority of those who have been using virtual worlds for five years or less. Somnium Space is second for those with less than a year's experience, followed by Altspace VR. Because the numbers for these last two are so small, three in total, we cannot make any inferences from this. For those with more experience, one to five years, Engage VR is still the clear winner other platforms getting a total of four votes. Now, if we turn the box and look at the more experienced users, again, we see Engage VR is as important for those with five to 10 years experience, but also that Altspace is important. Again, while we can't claim statistical significance with such a small sample, it is interesting to see that Engage VR seems to be a top platform for those with 10 or fewer years of experience. I will get to those with the most experience in a moment, but I want to stop and explain what I believe is the reason for the popularity of Engage VR. Now, Engage VR builds itself as an education and corporate training platform in virtual reality. It empowers educators and companies to host meetings, presentations, classes, and events with people across the world. Using the platform, virtual reality training and experiences can be created in minutes. The tools are very easy to use and require no technical expertise. You can choose to host your own virtual reality sessions live or record and save them for others to experience later. A wide variety of effective and immersive virtual experiences can be created with an extensive library of virtual objects, effects, and virtual locations available on the platform. Now, I believe the overriding reason is the platform is easy to use and it was built from the ground up for education. Some of the specifications for Engage include desktop OS support for Windows, Mac, and Linux. VR head support for Oculus Rift, Oculus Quest, Oculus Go, HTC Vive, Valve Index, Windows MR, Gear VR, Google Daydream, and HP Reverb. 
The default av avatars are human avatars, and everything is Unity-based. They do have a lot of presentation tools. You can stream in from, from OneDrive, Google, Dropbox, or Power and PowerPoint. However, some of the disadvantages of, of this platform include there is no mobile support, cannot create custom rigged avatars, it's closed source, which means you have to work with Engage to get um, added functionality. And as a pro member, you have to work with them to have 3D models and scenes added to Engage, while the number and the number of avatars, the maximum number is 50 people, although they say you can work with them to increase that. Another reason I believe it is popular is that the actual VR experience is very good compared to other platforms, especially platforms that have tried to move from virtual worlds like Second Life into VR, such as Science Space. They have developed to tools specifically for delivering educational experiences and, as I said, very easy to use. Now, to move to the last group, those with more than 10 years of experience, they chose a completely different platform, Open Sim or Second Life platform. This is actually not surprising because those that have a lot of experience working in this platform have high expectation for delivering quality education. They are the experts and they have tried some of the social VR platforms but have not yet had great experiences. They would therefore prefer to continue using OpenSim or Second Life until such time as the VR platforms catch up. The good news is that many of these experts are interested in working on improving are for education, and with their input, these platforms will eventually contain the functionality needed to create ex educational experiences as great, if not better, than they are in desktop virtual worlds right now. Sorry about that. Now, before I finish up my part, I want to point out the top eight criteria that were considered needed by the survey respondents for quality experiences in VR. These include the ability to use voice, the ability to use slides for presentation, an easy-to-use interface, a protocol in place for dealing with problem avatars, the ability to show videos in-world, desktop access for those without headsets or who have problems with headsets, the ability to easily transport, and the ability for people in headsets to interact with people on desktop versions. You can see most of the criteria and the percentages of respondents who felt this feature was needed. I have highlighted the top eight. Interestingly, I have also done an analysis of expertise versus the, each of the criteria, and I did not find any correlations between the cutoff percentage for making it into the top eight was 68.5%. And thanks. Thank you, Marie. Um, it's such important um, research to explore these spaces and and uh, really compare all of these advantages and disadvantages. And so we're going to move on to our next panelist, Elise. And Elise, your question. The panel has mentioned that there are many educators in 3D virtual worlds with decades of experience. Have any of those educators conducted research similar to your survey? survey? How did the results of that research compared to yours. Elise? Thanks. Um, so I am pulling out a, um, an object right now, and I'll let it, I'm going to move it a little bit and let it res. Okay, so it's off to the side, and I'll, I'll be explaining what on earth that is. Uh, so I found two studies that focus on creating criteria for using virtual worlds for education. Um, each of the studies are represented in this Venn diagram object that I have built. This way you can, at a glance, see exactly how the studies compared, where they overlapped, and that sort of thing. Uh, so the different colors represent different studies, um, and the different sizes correspond to the data in the criteria. Um, comparison spreadsheet that I've done, um, and I've got a link there. So someone had asked earlier if we have any of this published, um, and so we don't have anything, we don't have a full proper thing published, but some of these little bits that we've done, um, like this comparison sheet, I do. Um, and so I'm sharing that with you guys, so feel free to add out. Um, so the first study was published in 2011, the second in 2015, Vicars was in 2019. 
Uh, so I found 36 categories total across the three studies. Um, and there, one of them had 76 and Vicaris had 29. One of them had 28. Um, if you're doing the math, trying to figure out how I got 36 categories when one of them had 70 plus, um, it's because uh, a lot of them were kind of micro categories. And so like interactivity is one of the studies and that covered um, like four of the 2015 criterias. Um, so so that, that's how that happened. Um, but there were eight criteria that all three studies cited. Um, we had accessibility, build features, education-oriented platforms, interacting with creators and developers, media in world, reliability, sustainability, and usability. And the spreadsheet offers definitions of each of those if you're curious. Some of that's kind of jargon if I just toss out the term by itself. Um, what it tells us is that those eight criteria are pretty important when you're looking at uh, VR platforms for education, be that desktop only or headset compatible. So cross comparisons like this are really important because they help to verify our research, but not only that, they help to add to it. Um, uh, the, um, <laughs> sorry, um, part of this is just because, um, one, there are people that might no longer be with us that participated in the previous studies. Um, and two, there were different perspectives um, that might have been going on throughout the years. So it's helpful to have those um, kind of putting our heads together, not only with different colleagues, but over time as well. So there were seven items total in Vicara's study that didn't exist in the other two studies. Um, and that tells us that Vicar is going to want to really take a look at those. We're going to want to ask big questions um, like, were they um, less relevant then? They're just really important now, or maybe they're not as necessary as we think they are. Uh, so one of the ones uh, is snapshot and video capturing. Those were both listed in our study, but not in the other two. And it's possible that those weren't a big priority five to ten years ago. Um, today, we definitely have a huge emphasis on documenting your work. Uh, part of that is because we've seen so many um, It's also possible that they just knew that there were other ways to capture information and weren't worried about it. Uh, so again, that's where Vicara really needs to take a look into that and see why. Another one is viewer control which is the ability to have multiple windows accessible outside of your in-world view, <laughs> um, meaning you can check your email while you're in Second Life. You can open up um, things. So it was suggested by Vicara's survey participants. So technically, none of the studies, the 2019, 2015, or 2011, thought of that. It was something that was suggested to us. Um, the why is kind of obvious. Uh, I wanted to ask how many of you have windows open right now on your machines, aside from um, Firestorm or whatever viewer you use, right? Um, yeah, I pretty much always have at least Fire, um, Firefox open to have my email. Um, but um, you know who can't have windows up while they're in a virtual world? <laughs> Um, that would be people using headsets, um, and that would be a lot of the people that answered our study. <laughs> yeah, um, so it hadn't really occurred to us, but to them, that's something where they're like, oh my gosh, mind-blowing, wouldn't that be great? Um, and we're just like, well, we've been doing that for, you know, ever, but I mean, sure. Um, but the fact is, um, that you, it's very difficult to do it on, um, headsets. I, I'm pretty sure that there are ways to do it, but um, a lot of it is not there in current VR experiences. Um, and it is worth considering that there are headset purists. I'm not sure if that's the right word, but they feel like you shouldn't be able to open window. Um, I've met folks like that. Um, and the reason there is things in terms of immersion, they feel like it, it makes you more immersed. If you're um, on a spacewalk, you can't open up your phone or anything. Um, if you like to go LARPing um, in, in um, you know, live action stuff and it's historical, you can't bring your cell phone with you. Um, you know, that sort of thing. And they're saying, well, I mean, if you want to make it really immersive and really like a physical world scenario, then 
shouldn't be able to move away from it. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, I'm obviously a, just a huge fan of um, the ability to use desktop worlds. Um, and when you have that firsthand knowledge that it doesn't really detract from the immersion, it's, it's very difficult to convince me otherwise. Um, but I won't outright dismiss it. And I do kind of have the question of, uh, I'm curious what you think. And I see quite a few people have chimed in, which is wonderful. Um, like, are there times where it would be more immersive? Um, I mean, I suppose if you're doing, um, uh, military training, that's something, a lot of the simulation, I would bet that, no, you're not allowed to bring anything. Um, so I suspect there, there are cases where it could be. Um, as far as making that a requirement, um, that's something that's worth thinking about. Like, are students missing out if they don't have headsets? Um, I don't know, um, on a very personal level, no, but, um, I see Agile Bill says he likes the choice, um, and that, that's about where I am. I think for, um, accessibility reasons alone, <laughs> uh, it would be helpful to have desktop features. Um, but anyway, um, I'll finish up quickly. The rest of the criteria on the spreadsheet is color-coded. Feel free to peruse it. Um, you can find out which criteria overlap, just if you're a big old nerd like me, um, that it's you're gonna be very happy to go through that. Um, and you can take a copy of the Venn diagram. It should be fully modifiable. Um, feel free to use it to stuff. And if you click on it, there's a note card with citation to the different studies. Um, and please let us know if you know of other studies or even just authors that I should take a look at. It could be about 3D worlds, headset VR, um, or both. Um, let me know. Um, my email is, was, is at the beginning of the script and I can put it in again. Um, I would like to know because that would be really helpful for us. Um, and if you're interested in working with us, um, you can let us know too. You never know I'm going to do a partnership or something. Um, but so uh, that, that's it for uh, my question. Great. Thanks, Elise. Um, I do believe, as we pointed out in the text chat, there are specific times when a headset immersion might be of value. And as she said, look us up in some of these VR platforms if you're looking for someone to go exploring with. <laughs> and um, so we need to identify when, where, and which environment works best. And that's a challenge for ed educators. So next up we have Bree. So here's the question for Bree. When brain brainstorming criteria, 25 items were cate categorized according to need, want, or would be nice. The result of the survey differed from our initial thoughts. Um, so how did the survey results compare to Vakara's expectations? Okay, so um, pretend I'm Jody right now, um, and she's kindly put up her um, graph prop for me. Uh, so when brainstorming criteria, Vikara came up with about 25 items that would be categorized, categorized into three different groups. Need, want, or would be nice. And the results of the survey differed from our initial thoughts for 17 out of the 25 criteria, which is pretty significant. Um, the highlights, uh, this highlights the importance of surveys like this, and um, just because one group of educators feels one way doesn't mean that another group of educators feels the same way. Um, so as we polish our list of criteria and continue within our search, um, it'll be important to develop more surveys that reach an even broader audience. Um, of all of the different types of educators, um, and especially those that are exploring uh, teaching uh, in the headset compatible worlds, because that was something, um, uh, looking at the limitations of the research is something that we've been paying a lot of attention to. Um, and I think that Bethany will talk about um, a lot of information about the different types of, of folks interested in this um, when we get hurt. Um, so what was surprising um, about the results um, is that while Vicara had put, um, for some things, we had things that we wanted, things that we needed, things that we thought would just be nice, our survey um, respondents only had needs or wants. Not a single one of them was just, was, you know, ju just uh, would be nice. Um, three of the needs, uh, according to the respondents, were camera and video function and avatar customization. 
Now, the ability to communicate privately, such as avatar to avatar, was considered a wall. In a surprising move, 50% of our respondents suggested that we add in four extra criteria that we had not thought to include in the survey. So this was reliability, viewer functionality, um, which would be the ability to use other programs outside of the viewer, which would be would be browsers, send email, et cetera. And I actually just mentioned that. Um, and then sustainability or persistence of the SIM. Um, and I believe that there's a link to that, to another um, comparison spreadsheet. Um, if it's not, I'll go ahead and I can paste that in afterwards for folks that are interested in just kind of looking at the data. Um, so uh, there were only eight items that remained the same. All of those were considered needs, both by us and by 50% or more of the people who responded to the survey. This would be text chat, voice, ability to give slide viewer presentations, ability to interact with the platform, creators, developers, a protocol in place for harassment, desktop VR access, ability to teleport easily, cross-communication abilities between those with and without headsets. Um, and then all 29 of the criteria that resulted from the survey are important, but those eight are unquestionably crucial, um, unquestioningly crucial. Um, and I think it's very interesting that eight comes up. It came up in Bree's, mine, and Marie's talks. And if you look at it, they're all actually a little bit different. Um, so that was something kind of fun. Um, okay, so as far as the graphs that Bree has put up for me, um, the first graph, which is labeled Vicara, represents the expectations that we had for VR platforms as a group based on our collective experiences in virtual worlds. The second graph, which is labeled Survey, represents the findings of our survey. On the y-axis are the 25 criteria in the survey, and so each line represents about five criteria. On the x-axis are bars representing the categories would be nice, want, and need, so would be nice is orange, want is purple, and need is green. Um, and as I mentioned before, when you look at those, they're significantly different. So we anticipated that educators would qualify. Five of our criteria would be nice, and uh, in reality, um, they didn't think that at all. They thought a lot of them, like I said before, were wants or needs. Um, and we anticipated that educators would place 10 of our criteria in the want category, but only five ended up in that category. And we anticipated um, that educators would qualify 10 of the criteria as needs, but they actually placed the majority of them, which is 20. This, I mean, like that's doubling it um, in that category. And of interest, I mentioned this very briefly before, um, ability to interact with the platform's creators, developers is the only criteria that matches up with the eight that I, Elise, had mentioned um, in, in my um, analysis of the other two studies. So that, that's the only criteria that showed in, in, both, um, in both cases. And then text, chat, voice, ability to give slide viewer presentations, protocol in place for harassment and ability to teleport were criteria that were defined by Vicara in the 2015 study. So it, there was a little bit of overlap there, which is good. Um, uh, so then uh, receiving input from others involved in virtual worlds or VR has been an extremely enriching experience. Uh, we also want to welcome feedback from anyone that's in the audience today. It expands our knowledge, stimulates our creativity, and opens our minds to the ever-growing potential that virtual worlds and pursuit of enhancing virtual education. Um, I think that that um, is about it for uh, what Brie had to say. Thank you, thank you. Um, thanks, Bree, and thank you, Elise, for, for uh, the voice. <laughs> um, identifying these important criteria is critical to use in education, so thank you for that. And now we're going to ask Pat a question. Pat, it sounds like there were several surprises in the survey's results. Can you discuss one of the criteria that changed as a result of the survey? Yes, I thought I'd join you out here a little bit, and I put up a, a small um, slideshow up there. It's going to be rotating as I answer my question, and so the key points of my answer will uh, be in front of you, uh, not necessarily what I'm speaking to right at the moment. But uh, yes, that's true. One of the surprises was avatar customization. Just 
look around this space uh, at the very different persona that uh, are uh, present. And uh, I think right now in virtual worlds, this is very important to us. Uh, one of the surprises we had was that avatar customization, which we anticipated would be wanted, was expressed as needed by almost 53% of the respondents. And another 29 agreed with our initial assessment and stated customization was wanted. Fewer than 2% believe that customization is not necessary at all. I, like Marie, look for correlations between a desire for customization and responses to other questions. And the only relevant finding is that 77% of those in virtual worlds less than one year felt customization was needed. But if we combine needed and wanted, the figures range from a low of 41% for those in world one to five years to a high of 92% for those in world five to 10 years. And there was no correlation between those selecting any specific VR platform and the desire for customization. So it's obvious that some type of customization is desirable, but further study needs to be done in order to determine exactly what customization means. Let's consider avatar and personification based on experiences in virtual worlds. Avatar is really a Sanskrit word meaning descent, as in descent of the divine into an animal or human form. In computing, an avatar is a graphical representation of the user or the user's alter ego or character. Over the years, visitors to Vakara have participated in events as avatars very close to their actual self, or a fantasy self, or even as an ideal self. The person you might like to be in a world free of usual constraints. As you can see, uh, I'm young and uh, I'm not bad looking and I look terrific in any outfit I select and I enjoy that. So I'm one of those looking for the ideal self. Some of us are not content with just one avatar, but have several that can be donned as one would select a new outfit. This can be perfect for game playing or convenient when one of our avatar choices is offensive or frightening to others. Ask Elise what that means when you see her sometimes. Uh, there are times also when one avatar might be developed to represent a community, such as Vakara's guide, Namasani Seminaro. Trusted members of the Vakara team assume that avatar to remove unwanted builds, to edit property, to purchase objects, and more. The avatar we elect to represent us can be closely linked to our sense of self, our identity. Three examples are gender, age, and height. As far back as 1997, Shirley Turkle explained how exploring gender identity in cyberspace can shape a person's real life understanding of gender. For example, a man may find it easier to be assertive when playing a woman in Second Life. And a woman may have the opposite response, believing that it's easier to be aggressive when she's playing a man. In addition to assuming another gender merely to test emotional range, some find it liberating to assume the persona of the gender in which they feel more comfortable, such as a male assuming a female avatar and vice versa. Some players prefer to assume younger versions of themselves, as I do, while others attempt to find a more realistic representation and are frustrated when the avatars they are presented with reflect younger, more vibrant individuals, nothing like themselves. One individual, frustrated that he could not find an age-appropriate avatar, decided to become a bird and height. As a person who is height-challenged in real life, I'm 5'1", I tend to select avatars of medium height and second life, which are really equivalent to 5 to 6.5 feet. Unfortunately, that means I'm still short compared to the default avatar, which is usually the equivalent of 7 to 8 feet. Of course, if desired, I could also become taller, but I choose not to do that. Now, Let's see how we can equate our preference for avatar customization to our experiences in virtual reality. We haven't talked about Rumi and it wasn't part of our study, but it's a virtual reality platform for turnkey VR education and training. 
They explain that with the help of their easy to use avatar customization tool, users can capture their personality, exercise their sense of individuality, and create their true self. Well, this may be true if you have a very limited view of yourself since their avatars have heads and partial chests, no legs, and sometimes hands, depending on what the situation requires. No feet that I've seen so far. So maybe they're not needed for virtual education and training, but some users really may want to have all of their extremities. There is rationale behind this. Avatar actions that require fast motion, such as walking and flying, use more bandwidth than standing, especially when the former is in a dense area and the latter is in a sparse area. Virtual reality avatar bodies that have no need for limbs to move or outfits and accessories to don use less bandwidth than those that we may be used to in virtual worlds, such as Second Life. Those new to VR chat are presented with a number of avatar options, including those with names like Polygon 4932, Donut Man, and Area 51 Alien. For one who loves to shop for outfits in Second Life, spending a virtual eternity as Donut Man is not appealing. But again, the rationale is that these cartoonish characters available in VR chat take less bandwidth than more realistic representations. The choices available to newbies in alt space are also cartoonish in nature. One drawback to default avatars is that they stigmatize the person as new to the virtual reality space. Do you remember your first days in Second Life? Uh, who wants to be singled out because they are a blue and gray robot with um, no mouth and feet, and that's what I look like in all space right now. Virtual reality offers some powerful collaboration potential. The immersive environment allows team members not only to meet virtually, but to share ideas and work on 3D presentations and data visualization in real time, just as we're doing here today. When we meet as we are today, we're not really attending in person, uh, especially because of the coronavirus. It's very good that we can do this. What we're doing, though, is sending our delegate. That's who you see in front of you. And if this were a business meeting, we might want that delegate to have a very good likeness to ourselves. In spring of 2019, Japanese communication giant SoftBank demoed a VR communication and social platform called Epic Play Live. And the most compelling feature is the ability to personalize realistic avatars. To create the 3D avatars, users start with a selfie and a short voice recording made on their mobile device. AI is used. Avatars are designed to look and sound like each individual user. Motion capture technology brings the avatars to life in the VR environment. Users are able to see, speak to, and interact with the lifelike counter, uh, counterparts of their colleagues, friends, or families with movements that are captured in real time from the smartphone camera. Right now, this is a prototype, but it's one example of how a verse person's virtual persona may one day closely resemble their physical one, at least for work. So each of the platforms mentioned here today and many others visited as part of the study so far have benefits and drawbacks. For example, uh, I'd like to know how I can meet with any one of you to play tennis in VR, even if I do have feet and arms, if those feet and arms don't bend at the knees and elbows so that we could really play a game. Obviously, more work needs to be done if we want to have a truly immersive experience in virtual reality. Studies like this one will help us learn what worked well for us in virtual worlds and what didn't, while helping to inform the development of virtual reality platforms so we can enjoy those and additional features. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. This has been really great hearing that. And now we're going to move on to Bethany. Bethany, survey participants were split over how they use VR for education. VR in the classroom, such as taking a physical classroom on a, <clears throat> a virtual field trip, or, <clears throat> or VR as the classroom, 
for distance education. And a significant number wanted to use VR for both. So what are the advantages for each of those configurations? Bethany? Well, certainly there are advantages and disadvantages for both configurations. And ultimately, we have to accept some trade-offs and not wait for something perfect to come along. Uh, it was less than 4% of the survey respondents who said they want VR solely for in the classroom. And more than half said they wanted to use it in both ways, in the classroom as well as a classroom in and of itself. So that means we have two very different use cases. Um, and so let's just look at using VR in the physical classroom. And I've got a little visual for this. I'm not as great a builder as some other people, but <laughs> um, we can all easily imagine, you know, being able to transport students on a virtual tour, like what I really enjoyed with Oculus Rift, where you walk uh, outside the International Space Station, you know, in a head-mounted display. That's amazing. And using VR in the classroom, you can create really visceral experiences that are impossible to provide in the physical world. And, you know, maybe that can excite a youngster to persevere in their science studies, for example. So those kind of standalone experiences lend themselves nicely to a physical classroom as a discrete experience that fits into a larger lesson facilitated by maybe discussion or some other kind of instruction in the classroom. But that's a very top-down designed kind of experience. And while those certainly have a place, uh, what we know about online teaching and learning, especially in higher education and adult learning theory, that kind of top-down lesson design has some limitations. And most of the standalone VR experiences uh, from what I've seen are often like this. They're, they're not really calling upon the uh, person for having any kind of agency in the same way that more open exploration and interactions that we have in a open virtual world or sandbox world like Second Life or OpenSim. So the usefulness of this kind of thing really depends on the learning objectives. For example, I saw a VR immersive for nursing where you're standing inside, and this is with a head-mounted display, standing inside the chamber of a heart, and you're seeing the blood flow and how the valve works from different angles. But if we think about it a moment, we might ask ourselves, in what specific way is that actually more instructionally effective than an online object that you manipulate and can rotate around to see the same way, see the same thing? You know, making something immersive for immersive sake isn't enough. It's like you know, having a 360 video in a head-mounted display. What exactly is the benefit? I can pan around on my computer to see uh, the entire 360 video, but seeing a shark in a head-mounted display is superior in the, in the visceral sense of fear and awe. But the question it really begs is this, is that emotional or visceral response what's actually called for in the lesson? Does it help meet the learning objective? And is that the best or only way to do that? And honestly, I keep coming back to when 3D glasses came out for movies. Really super cool, right? But the truth is all the special effects in the world don't make up for a crappy story. Now, I'm not saying standalone in the VR classroom with head-mounted display isn't amazing. Um, I'm just saying that I think some people need to be a little bit more critical because from where I sit, I see people being very wild by razzle-dazzle and not always thinking about it from the, um, you know, the instructional design side or the, the, the critical, is this meeting a learning objective? So another benefit, though, of the in-classroom modality is it's probably a lot easier to start out with since you'll have people on hand, assuming you'll have people on hand who can help with the tech support side of things. Um, and I think we all know from experience that with any educational technology, there's going to be glitches and managing frustrations for both the teachers and the learners is important. And we don't want the technology to get in the way of the learning. Because again, in my experience, if it's not pretty seamless, ultimately it'll be interpreted as more gimmicky or more trouble than it's worth than anything else. And I think that's really kind of a key thing here. But like I said, most people from the survey want to be able to use this kind of technology to advance distant education. And that's another thing entirely. So going from VR in the classroom to VR as the classroom is like the difference between teaching face-to-face -face and teaching 100% online. And in fact, I have a, a different visual for that. So uh, let me pull this one out right here. But teaching, you know, going from teaching face-to-face uh, -to, -face to teaching online is, is, is kind of like this. 
um, if you're, um, you know, if, if you're, if standalone VR is like uh, uh, each person in a headset is like each person in their own little VR bubble, then virtual classrooms would need to be much larger environments with lots of different ways to interact and overlap with each other. And the unreliability of most social VR platforms using head-mounted display, or even with their desktop options, they're just no way near ready to deploy. I mean, the only exception I, as I see it is desktop VR, which is very stable in comparison. So that's what we're using here. Virtual worlds like Second Life and OpenSim are so much larger in these than these VR platforms in, in all respects, like the features they offer, the history, the global reach, the research that we've had, the knowledge from a mature community of practice um, in teaching in virtual environments. So, and, and just from a plain old accessibility standpoint, VR, desktop VR, is good to go right now, and it's stable, and it's robust, and you don't need any special equipment. I mean, people participate in virtual world conferences like this, from laptop computers, on Wi-Fi, in coffee shops, in non-first world countries right now. Social VR platforms, well, I kind of think they're like asteroids in comparison. Now, there were a lot of people in that survey rooting for a specific platform, and I have to say, I was kind of shocked, and I'll just say straight up, that the proselytizing for sort of a favorite platform. And, and you can read it for yourself. I read through every response that a lot of those respondents had little to zero experience with any other platform. And they are very passionate about VR and education, but totally unaware of this in-world community and its long history. So I have a relevant third, world, uh, third visual here if we want to entertain what it might look like if we did try and use one of those platforms for, um, you know, for a classroom, um, let me pull this one out right here. Um, so this is, you know, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about my experiences in the CVL panel on intentional immersion on Saturday, but I had an experience recently. Uh, and so this is what might look like if we did try and use one of these platforms that are still in beta for a virtual classroom right now. Um, I had an experience, this was in a private session in, in Engage, where I was using the Titanic Museum environment, which is really beautiful. But after a few minutes, I suddenly heard other people in my session, and I hadn't invited anyone to it. And I walked around, and I'm, I'm in a head-mounted display, and I walked around the corner, and I found I was not the only person in my session. There were two other people who were obviously testing their own session and talking about what was visible in the different student headsets they had. And in fact, it's hard to see in this picture. Um, one of them is standing there by the wheel. He was almost invisible. Um, the other one was right there and taking fun selfies with them. And I, I tried to engage with both of them. I listened to them talk back and forth for about five minutes. And they, they didn't see me or hear me. But this is just one tiny little example. Imagine the confusion of some kind of a technical overlap like this in a classroom setting, just, you know, crazy. So if people want to have a virtual environment as a classroom, I just have to say you could teach an entire class and people have done it here in Second Life or in OpenSim. We've had the technology and people in this conference have done tons of presentations about how hard it is to get faculty to just get into this world. Um, but ironically, the people who I think would most benefit from working in virtual worlds and meeting others uh, to collaborate with here and, and learn from, I think they're kind of stuck in their own little bubbles and are oblivious to the fact that conferences like this one even exist. So here's my key takeaways when I think about using VR, whether in the classroom or as a classroom. I think it's critical that anyone who's seriously interested in immersive learning, and I see this everywhere I go, um, they need to get more involved with the communities of practice that are right here in Second Life and in OpenSim. We've got to crowdsource our efforts to compare notes, to share ideas and collaborate more so we can get past our own blinders. But a lot of people who responded on that survey, they really had very little experience um, and yet they felt perfectly qualified to weigh in on what platform they thought was best, but then couldn't articulate why. But the people with the most experience in terms of years seem to be the most open to exploration. The people who are most not committing to one, you know, saying, hey, this is the one and only, this is the best. And I think people really need to consider their blinders um, and, to, and trying to get beyond that. My final point is this, and this is the most important point, you guys. The fact is the features that everyone agrees are really critical 
are already found in virtual worlds with one single exception, one exception, and that's having head mounted display and desktop interacting together. That is the sole exception, you guys. And if Kitely is even VR ready or close to at some point, I think that's pretty exciting news, but I ask you this, knowing that, don't you think we should all be advocating for more use of the tools we actually have here right now? I mean, clearly the time is now for the world outside to take a second look at Second Life and OpenSim. Absolutely, Bethany. I think all of us that are here agree with that statement. And I think, wow, you've all given us a good overview of where VR is right now. Head-mounted displays are not always necessary, and virtual worlds are already here. They allow users to create content easily with digital identity of customized avatars. So continued research will help us identify the best practices for each immersive landscape. Thanks, everybody.